Hey everyone, how's it going? I hope you're all doing great, as I always say. And in this video, I have a bunch of encounters dealing with the Bigfoot and the Yowie and things like that. So, if that sounds like something that you're interested in, definitely pull up a stump with me and let's jump into it. Thank you for watching. So a while ago, I had my own Bigfoot experience. I was walking through the woods in southeast Oregon, and I came across a few of these weird structures in the woods. They were made of sticks, quite big ones. Some of the sticks on the ground looked like weapons, but they weren't formed from splintering or cutting. There were also a few unnatural rocks that looked like proto-tools ancient ones, and there were a few deer corpses around as well. I joke out loud to myself about it being a Sasquatch, and then I turn around to retrieve my camera from its pack, and then I see it in the trees. This massive, hairy, ape-like human. It had to be well over ten feet tall. It was totally non-violent toward me, the vibe I got from it was that it just wanted me to leave. So, I did. I just left my camera in my pack, and I ran away. And I made sure to avoid that entire area ever since then. So I have to ask, has anybody had a really close encounter with a Sasquatch. I was camping at Mount Baker in Washington. I set up my tent in this really cool spot by a valley lake. And honestly, the trip was great. Nothing happened, just beautiful scenery. Until 3 a.m., I get jarred awake by the sounds of cracking branches and then sloshing water. I slowly and quietly as I can get up and poke my head out through the tent. Less than 20 feet away is this huge, bipedal, hairy organism washing itself in the river. I'm holding my big knife, which is all I had, to my chest, and nervously awaiting if it's going to notice me and freak out. After it washes itself, I hear thundering, slappy steps coming through the branches again, and onto the soft earth by the water. It's walking up the trail toward my campsite. I hear its heavy, primal, deep and guttural animal breathing. Definitely not human, but not an animal either. I think that this has to be a Sasquatch. It's like the stories I've heard. It comes up to my tent and looks at it, almost like it's trying to figure out what it is and then it moves on. I stay awake the rest of the night, and I leave as soon as it's daylight. The mountain has a haunted old gold mine shaft too. The night prior, I had heard a woman scream, and then gunshots, late at night, but I thought that was something totally different. I think I know what they saw. This was my encounter with the Pacific Northwest's legendary cryptid. So, it was around October in 2002. I was in my room, I was jamming out to music and playing SOCOM US Navy SEALs on the PS2. It was around 11 o'clock at night. I hear lots of commotion outside. The horses are going absolutely ham out in the corral running around in a panic. I go to see what the hell's going on. I figure there might be a mountain lion or a bear nearby. The horses continue to freak out. One of them even bursts straight through a barbed wire fence, cutting their chest wide open to try and escape whatever the heck is out there. I go and wake up my parents. They get dressed and they go to investigate. We both hear noises from the hillside above our house. There's definitely something up there. 
my parents grab an old Colt New Frontier 22 revolver and head toward the base of the hill. Something massive is stomping through the fallen leaves. It's even pushing over dead trees. I suggest shooting a few rounds into the darkness to scare it off, or whatever. And then we hear this massive roar. It was that same dragon-like roar from all the local Bigfoot TV shows. Off in the distance, we hear a fainter roar coming from farther back in the hills. And we think, oh crap, there's more of them. The thing stomps off through the brush without a further incident. The horses eventually quiet down, and things go back to normal. Later on, I shot an email off to the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization and told them about it. An investigator from Western Washington calls me back within a few days and says that Ashford is a hotbed of Bigfoot activity. He said he personally believes that there's a community there of at least 20 or 30 creatures in the whole area. He says that they don't post many of the reports they receive on their website about them, in order to protect the creatures. I've heard reports of other sightings from locals in the same area, having encountered them and seen them on local logging roads or finding the elusive footprint. Now my grandma was a bit of a drinker and to her old age and she's been gone for a good six years now, but as far back as I can remember, she said that water spots belonged to the Yowies, almost as though some of them were territorial in that aspect. She thought that the Yowies were bad things, things that had gone wrong, things that the earth, quote, gave birth to in its sickness, and each Yowie is given birth to in its own area usually a body of water that belongs to it. Now, I don't believe in that bit, but I do believe in Yowies, and I do believe them in being territorial over water spots. It's where they would feed. She said that in a country like Australia, a good water source is wealth. You attract a mate by having a big area of water, plenty of food, safety, and of course, shows of strength. She said stories of her being little and finding bones of sheep and dogs and stuff lodged in the banks of her old farm from when she was a child. How at first it seemed like the creatures had drowned, but then there got more and more. It almost seemed like a little mass grave. She thinks that the Yowies are decorators and only come out at certain points to either hunt, forage, or collect things. She also said if one is chasing you, to never go to water to escape because they don't fear water, because it belongs to them, and they can take you places. And the yowling that you hear, the screaming, is, according to my dad, something that yowies do when they think that another yowie is getting all up in its territory. Hence, you hear it when you're out camping. You hear something checking you out in the middle of the night. Something that's kind of rummaging through your stuff, and you're terrified. The Yowie realizes that you're not another Yowie, and they're not worth doing battle with. So it's probably either confused as to what you are, afraid of you, or doesn't really care. It leaves and goes back to its den. My dad has also stated that he thinks that some Yowies can drive others away or exile them, and that's why some of them seem to travel so far. It makes sense too that one Yowie that's looking for a new place to live could set off a chain reaction in other Yowies as it travels through their territories. But yeah, the only big no-no is water. When I was 19, I lived in a small logging town in the Pacific Northwest. I was tight with two other friends, a guy and a girl. There was nothing to do here at night, 
the closest town was about an hour and a half away, so we just drive around on dark, deserted roads at night. Usually, we will find somewhere to pull over, get out of the car, talk, dance, be weird, and shout into the night. So on this one particular night, it was 2 a.m., and we were lying on the road. It's a side road off the highway, 10 miles from any homes. It's trees on both sides, and that goes on forever. It's totally safe, it's a straight stretch of road, and there probably won't be another vehicle for another couple hours at least. So we're lying side by side, staring up at the stars, and we're passing around a cigarette, and we're just laughing and carrying on like goobers. And then I hear the crack of a twig. I think it's just an animal, but it still makes me a little uneasy. So I shh the others. They're still laughing and carrying on, but I can definitely hear what sounds like something walking in the trees. I get anxious and tell them louder to both stop talking and listen. They hear it too. The female friend says, yeah, it's footsteps. And then she calls out, who's there? I whisper to her to shut up. The footsteps stop. There's no reply. I don't know why, but at this point, I sensed danger. My spine goes cold. My eyes are watering. That total fear. I say, guys, uh, we should get in the car. They all agree. We pile in and I lock the doors and turn on the ignition. It's just like a movie. It's almost surreal thinking back on it. I feel what I can only describe as an icy white fear. Just as we start to roll on and move further down the road, there's a massive crack at the back of the vehicle. All of us yell and scream. A massive rock has hit and dented the trunk. I scream some more and I swear at it. I floor it, but the friend in the back tells me that he can see something. As we're driving off, he said that there was this really big guy behind the car that looked like he was full of hair and like over seven feet tall, and he was built like a truck. He wished he got a better look, but he was only going by the light from the rear lights and the bright moon. I tell myself that it wasn't a Sasquatch, but I really think it was. We never did go down that road again, and this happened 20 years ago or so. I'm probably missing a couple of details, such as more stuff that was said, but I can tell you that the story is accurate. These two are my suspected experiences with the Yowie. I'm Australian, so that's what we call it. So story one actually happened after story two, but it's shorter, so I'll start with that one. I was out on a rural property near the town of Apsley, Victoria, with two of my mates and some of their family. It's an old sheep farm, but it borders a lot of native forests, there's also heaps of little creeks and dams nearby. We are out one night by a campfire in an old half an oil drum in the middle of a dusty paddock by an old disused sheep shearing shed. We're sitting around chatting, just watching the stars, you know, the usual camping stuff. We're chatting away and suddenly we hear some odd sounds from near the shearing shed by the old dam. There's a line of trees and an old dry creek bed near the dam, and we couldn't tell if the sound was coming from in the tree, at ground level, or from the creek bed. It was pitch black, and we couldn't see it either. At first, we just joked around, saying that it was a possum or a koala, which makes some pretty scary sounds in their own right. But it sounded bigger, much bigger. We started to feel a little off, but being young fellas, we were trying to be all macho and hide our fear. We start making sounds back at whatever it was. 
It's hard to describe what the sound was. The best I can describe it as is a deep howl mixed with a bark. It didn't last very long, but it had the low notes of a howl, and kind of went up at the end like a bark. While doing this, we start to feel a little better, so I make a mock, growl-like sound back at it. Whatever this thing was, it repeated the exact same sound that I made back at us. It was surreal. We didn't know how to react. Then again, it did it again, and then again, each time with very little variation, but it was getting closer. After we had packed up our stuff and headed back toward our cars, no one else said they had heard anything odd, but they were all sleeping in an old farmhouse that was quite a ways away, near the front of the property. That experience still creeps me out, and this took place somewhere between 2015 and 2016, but the longer one here took place in 2013 or 14, I believe. So, for this one, I was camping with two buddies in rural Victoria on his family's property. It's a large block of scrubland that's bordered by a native forest and eucalyptus plantations that has a single cabin in the center of the property. I don't want to post the town names because it's too easy to find it with Google Maps if I do, and the property is still owned and used by his family as well. So, we didn't actually use the cabin at all. We didn't even have the keys for it at the time. Either way, it had no power and was never really used at that point all that often. And we really wanted to camp out in a tent anyways. We had a kayaking trip planned for the following day. That was an hour or so away, so the 4x4 was towing one of those rental trailers that was stacked with a few kayaks and canoes that you sometimes see outside of petrol stations that have the big rent me sign on it. The ground around the cabin was way too rocky and compacted to pitch our tent, so we went out in the bush away into this small clearing that was among the scrub where the ground was more forgiving enough to get the tent going, and a small fire. We set up the tent and got the gear that we needed inside of the tent along with our sleeping stuff, etc. The scrub is very thick out here. After about 100 to 150 meters, all the trees kind of blend into one. It's hard to keep your focus on one thing, especially when the wind hits it and the trees start to sway. The forest gets thicker at the back of the property as well, where it connects to the native forest. We had this day mostly freed up, as we got there relatively early, and we didn't plan on leaving to go kayaking until lunchtime the following day. We had a few plans on what we wanted to do, most of which involved hiking and exploring. We first headed up an old motorbike or a quad trackway to the back of the property and hopped the really poorly maintained fence. It looked over a hundred years old. The wire and stumps were rusted and rotted as hell. This was into the native forest on the other side. We followed the other fence line for some time, until we came to an open field by a creek bed. The area had been used previously, but a long time ago by the looks of things. There was a lot of rusted farming equipment or tree clearing equipment, etc. The field was covered in grass about four to five feet tall, which slowly got shorter and shorter closer to the creek. While this creek was dry, it was certainly alive and had held water quite recently, as the soil was cool and almost but not quite damp. There were kangaroo footprints all over the creek bed and the banks nearby, so the area gets used often by fauna. We continue on, following the creek, and soon realize that the creek is joined by another, larger creek, which connects to the dirt road that the entrance to the property is on, though a fair distance away now at this point. The road goes over the creek with a small single lane concrete bridge. This creek held a lot more water, but the water level was still quite low in some areas of the creek and it didn't have very much water at all. 
There was enough water in some parts that there were probably some decent fish, though. We didn't stick around too long at the bridge and continued onwards. Some of the deeper portions were clear enough that you could see small fish and tadpoles swimming around. We continued on to a point where the creek got quite rocky and the water level was relatively shallow and scattered along the side of the creek bed and inside it were freshwater mussel shells. It seemed odd to say the least. Some were very old, as if almost falling apart in the sun, but others were fresh. Some were broken, as though they had been smashed by a rock. Others were like they had been pried open. A ten meter stretch of the creek bed was dotted with heaps and heaps of them. We checked out the surrounding area a bit more, but in the moment we thought very little of it. At first, I thought it might have been from the fishermen, but the creek wasn't wide enough to cast even a child-sized fishing rod. We headed back the way we came, but this time on the other side of the creek, we came back to the bridge. We passed under the bridge, trying not to slip into the water. Looking in the side of the bank, we noticed bones sticking out of the mud and sand. Kangaroo bones, as far as I could tell. It was as though that it had been buried when the flow of water was much stronger and higher, but also it seemed like that it had been pushed into the bank, or placed there. The area under the bridge where we found it was relatively free of debris, so it seemed really out of place. Luckily, there was no smell though. We ended up retracing our steps after this, and we headed back to camp. We screw around for a few hours and have a late lunch and then start setting up a campfire before the sun sets. I myself have never camped in this area before, but one of the two friends that I was with had. His family owned the property after all. I was pretty bad at making a campfire, so he did most of the work in that department. He said that he had never camped here with so few people though. Most of the time when he camps here, there's two or three families and they have a big party. This time, it was just the three of us. I returned for one of the parties a year later and it was great fun actually. The sun started to set and we went and sat by the fire and ate some half stale sandwiches and chatted. We ended up crawling into the tent around midnight. And then, I wake up startled at 1.30 a.m. I was just barely able to see my watch face, even with its backlight. I could hear something outside the tent. My friends weren't awake yet, so I decided not to wake them. I roll over onto my belly and I brought myself up with my elbows to just listen. Whatever it was, was getting closer to the tent. I could hear its feet trod through the undergrowth, and I could hear its mass brushing up against the bracken ferns as it approached. It gets close, I would say within five meters or so, and then stops. I can hear it breathe, or sniff the air, or something I couldn't quite tell. It sounded raspy, like how a larger person does when they breathe. Slowly, it moved closer to the tent, and started to make its way around, anti-clockwise. It got so close to the tent that the cracking of sticks beneath its feet was almost deafening. This is when my friends started to wake up. They seemed confused and as afraid as I was. Whatever it was, it seemed to switch from moving on all fours and then moving on two legs. When I realized that, I could barely move, let alone breathe. I was frozen with fear. Not one of us made a sound. Things got quiet for a bit. We whisper a few words to each other. That's when this thing starts laughing. Well, it sounded like laughing. It was a deep, raspy sound, like it was coming from deep within the diaphragm. It would trail sometimes off into a howl or a bark. It didn't sound like any animal that I had ever heard of. It was so terrifying that I could barely think. It continued on for what felt like forever before it moved back off the way it came. It would stop and start and make deep hooping sounds when it was stopped at about 10 to 20 second intervals before moving off again deeper into the forest. 
Once it had reached a considerable distance, we couldn't hear its movement anymore, only its calls, and we started to WTF pretty hard. We were all as silent as possible, but pretty obviously losing our crap. It continues to call for a while, repeating the same howl-like call over and over again, until in the distance it gets answered by another call. Whatever it was, there's two of them. We proceed to crap our pants more for the next four hours until the sun comes up. Once whatever it was trailed off into the distance, we didn't hear anything until the sun actually came up, but we were still scared. So we packed the camp up pretty quickly, and we had very little sleep. We just left the property, drove to the river where we were going to go kayaking. I had never felt so exhausted in my entire life. We spoke little about it when we were actually on the river kayaking, but it definitely rattled us pretty bad because conversation was fleeting at best. We never really discussed it properly until some weeks later. That's when I decided to look into it and see what I could find out. But I believe it was a Yowie. So, what'd you think of those encounters? Let me know which one was your favorite one down in the comments. Do you have an encounter or story of your own? I have an email in the description below that you can send them to if you want to. I also have a PayPal and a Patreon if you want to support the channel in that way. If you liked the video, or just like what I do, then definitely think about subscribing. Every little bit helps there too. And yeah, I think that I will thank you for pulling up a stump, and I will catch you in the next one. Thank you for watching.